Um, and thanks uh, everyone for, for joining today. And I think it was about just a little over a year ago when we presented kind of the, the, what the theme to be what is and um, the motivation of it and, and kind of where we, what our plans were in the immediate future. And then we quickly got derailed with COVID. And so, you know, while, while COVID has wreaked havoc on our field and, and experimental plans, um, we still have some, uh, you know, data to present some, some activity and progress has been made over the last year, um, uh, albeit slower than, than hoped, but that's where we are. And so I think um, what I'm planning on doing today is kind of summarizing some of the activities and, uh, and updates on things that have happened over the last year. Uh, and, uh, and then Chance is going to highlight some of the more recent experimental and field work that's been conducted within the last, since the new year. And so and it has some interesting results. And so, and I also apologize up front for, for um, any um, other further updates that, that are missed uh, in this summary. So it's, I just wanna give you kind of a state of where I understand things are um, with regard to theme 2B and that's the effects of kelp, the kelp reef system on the processing and fate of, of organic matter. Let's get this. Okay, so what is um, what is the two B? The questions that we're you know we're um, we're mainly trying to address is is um, is the water column organic matter POM and DOM altered as water flows through the kelp forest? So uh, Nick presented a really nice uh, presentation last week, demonstrating kind of the outfitting and physical characterization of, of kelp beds and the, the work going forward. And the idea here is to kind of integrate some similar, you know, measurements of physical flow with, with in tracking um, acti microbial activity and um, fate and characterization of DOM, uh, as well as production and export of, of organic matter. Um, and then one of the other portions of the theme is to, to assess the bioavailability of DOM remineralization rates, are they, are they different in versus out of the kelp forest? And then another question that we're interested in, is there a distinct microbial signature associated with the water as it passes through the kelp bed? This is in terms of, of uh, microbial activity as well as uh, community structure. And so while, while our plans to kind of increase the sampling frequency and, and coming and, and actually enacting the the transects across the kelp bed over a variety of or numerous months um, that kind of got derailed with with our inability to get into this field. Um, there was some progress that was made with regard to some of those samples that had been collected previously, and then, uh, as as I indicated, Chase, Chance is going to describe some of the more recent uh, work that was done. So, good news. Um, this was work that was kind of highlighted last last year uh, and was accepted over the past year. Um, this is some really great work that uh, Anna James uh, led out of Lizzie Wilbanks lab, where the burning question was, was fairly basic, but based, the idea was what does what the kelp microbiome look like in the presence or absence of, of, the, um, of the bryozoan membranifera? And, and, and how does that impact the, um, or is, it, is there something that, um, does the community structure in the microbiome alter in the presence of the, of the bryozoa? And so for those unfamiliar with the study, basically Anna and her team would go out to the, uh, the kelp forest uh, and they would, they would survey a variety of, of healthy blades and rhizone encrusted blades. And they would sample using these uh, super sucker samplers, which basically imprint on top of the, of the, of the kelp blade and draw samples directly off the blade without, without um, getting interference from the water column around it. They would concentrate those samples on these Sterivex filters and then extract the, the, uh, the DNA, um, amplify the, the, um, the, the, uh, the DNA with, um, with B4 primers and then generate um, a variety of amplicons uh, so to assess the phylogenetic variability between um, these healthy blades and bryozoan encrusted blades. So really a good assessment of the community structure on these, on these, uh, on these blades. And she sampled um, many samples from Arroyo Kamado and Mohawk Reef over a variety of different times. Um, and the basic take home there was that 
there is consistent differences over time and site with regard to uh, the community structure that appears on the healthy blades in the bright zone. And so this is a, a, a complex ordination plot, um, uh, NMDS plot, which basically demonstrates that independent of the timing of, of, uh, of, uh, of the sampling and where the samples were collected, whether it be Arroyo Camado or Mohawk, there was clear separation uh, between um, the healthy unencrusted blades and the bryozoan blades. And the idea here there is to is first understand that if there are differences on the microbiome of the microbiome um, on the on the blades, and there is. And now the next set of questions to be addressed was, you know, is there difference differences in the metabolic strategies associated with these organisms that would take a further analysis with from metagenomes and metatranscriptomes. That was the potential focus or the focus going forward and that has that has been that had been halted. Um, nonetheless, it does gives a, gives a gives us some, some insight as to how the microbiome is changing on these on these blades and has provides some uh, potential hypothesis or hypothesis about the quality of the material that's being sloughed off or released as a result of that community community structure shift. And the other big thing here is that um, when the, the community structure is driven um, by the changes in just the uh, of, of basically six of the families of, of bacteria that are that are found in the NMDS space, enhancing gamma proteobacter um, uh, varos and the planktos um, on the on the kelp compared to the seawater. So, and then um, uh, students, Savan and Ann out of Holly, Mil uh, Holly Milders and Lizzie's uh, group and Holly's and, um, and uh, Adrian's group wanted to go uh, a little further in studying uh, cohort development on, on the colonization of the, of the, uh, of the blades and, and how that assembly, assembling the community structure may shift uh, in time on the blade and over, um, over environmental vari variables like temperature and, and light over depth. So basically they was, the questions were, how do the blades uh, micro, microbiome communities assemble over time? And how does that vary with depth given the change in, in temp temperature uh, irradiance and, and potential um, nutrient structure? So the focus there was to um, go out um, Savan went out and, and tagged a, a bunch of blades uh, to that, that that was then used as a marker to say we're looking at, now we're interested in following the new growth. They would return two weeks later and take a sample from those different uh, different depths in the water column or of the of the frond, and then retag it. Come back another two weeks later and resample the tips. So you had two things. You had um, you could you could track. Uh, you can track the change in microbial assemblages or what the microbial assemblages on the blade look like for the same age blade. And then you could track how that those blades were being, um, uh, how the cohort was changing or not changing over time within a given blade. And so this was a pretty intensive study, um, basically five fronds, three blades per frond per time point per depth. So there's a lot of data that went in here. And the idea was of course to run this time series out for uh, several weeks to months, um, uh, but basically got halted after after two weeks because of uh, because of inability to get into the field. But some really interesting data was um, generated as a result of the samples that were collected. And so these are some some um, brief results. And and uh, if I'm getting this wrong, Holly, please step in. But basically, the idea here is that the the overwhelming observation is. And not surprising is the the communities on the blades are different from that of the water column. That was similar and consistent with what Anna found. Uh, but then you also have this big giant cloud of 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 uh, amplicon variability that's trying to make sense of that is is was the challenge. And so there's some pretty interesting ideas or data that's in here. And if you look at just the um, the if you focus the points on the centroids of these different clusters, you can see some patterns that are starting to evolve here. And so let's, if we look at all the, um, the symbols, surface, mid and bottom ones, those are the communities that were um, resolved on the uh, blades after two weeks of incubation after tagging. And then you can follow that cohort on the solid lines through, through time. 
And so this is a, a cohort that is uh, um, a, a two weeks beyond this sampling point. And the dashed lines are the sampling, the co uh, is, are the samples of, of a new blade that is also of similar age, um, but, a, a, but a different blade. So basically we're comparing community structure on the similar age blades, but also tracking a, a, a community through time. And so the main point here is that in the surface, the communities of the similarly aged blade compared to one that had been growing and colonized for, for some time, um, basically show very similar communities, suggesting that this, these blades are experiencing similar processes. Maybe it's um, uh, you know, high photosynthetic rate or high visibility or exposure to UV or high light or sloughing off of, of, uh, of DOM or organic matter results in, in a similar community that's being colonized on these uh, in the assembly of the colonies, or of the assembles, sorry, of the community structure, um, um, whether it's being developed over time or recently colonized. And then if you go deeper in the water column, you see that the cohort is very different from the two, week, two weeks later. It seems to take hold in, in go along a trajectory to a community that's very different from the community that is again, a two week old blade. So the, the, basic, the basic idea here is that you can track a cohort um, and basically the, the, the assemblages that are found in the, in the mid water and the bottom water seem to take hold and follow a, uh, a, a trajectory of, of community assembly that is a uh, that is different from, and it's different potentially every time. So as a cohort develops on the, on the, the mid and bottom um, fronds, they may take a different trajectory over time. Okay. All right, so another thing that we're interested in this, in this, um, uh, in this theme is really tracking DOM and the dynamics of DOM in, in the kelp reef and how it changes. So the, basically the idea here is that uh, the partitioning of kelp derived organic matter changes um, in between the particulate in, in dissolved phases and where it goes in a particulate or dissolved phase has great implications as to where that nutrients is being processed, um, where the nutrients are, or where the energy is being processed, where the nutrients are being regenerated. And if it's retained in, in, uh, in, the, in the bed itself, in the kelp reef itself or exported away. And we know that the organic matter partitioned as DOM has two main fates. And one is that it fuels instantaneous microbial productivity, uh, and that leads to remineralization uh, of, or, of organic matter back to its inorganic constituents that are retained locally, or that or dissolved organic matter resists rapid degradation. And as the water is flowing through the, 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 the kelp reef and uh, offshore, um, potentially leading to export of that organic matter um, from the coastal ecosystem. And it's this, it's this, um, uh, fate that has been gaining a lot of attention uh, recently. So if we look at some recent activities um, associated with the National Academies, they're looking at uh, strategies of sequestration of organic matter. And one of the focal points is to look at the role of, of uh, export production associated with macroalgal organic matter and how it plays a role in sequestration. And if those of you, many of you are probably familiar with this uh, provocative article by uh, Kraus Jensen and Duarte, which kind of discuss, use a meta-analysis of a, a lot of different data uh, that are collected around the globe from, from macroalgal uh, reefs, um, which suggests that macroalgal um, e export production is, is an important part of sequestration, carbon sequestration. And so if we look at this figure over here, this, these are the variety of pathways of sequestration of macroalgal carbon in the ocean. And all of these, all of the units are expressed as uh, teragrams carbon per year. Um, basically, they say uh, out of the 1,500 uh, teragrams of carbon per year that are are, are produced uh, for, in macroalgal reefs, um, the study claims that about 52% of that is exported as uh, organic, uh, as D DOC. Okay, so with two exclamation points, and if we go a little bit further. They also say that the study then claims that of the uh, organic matter that's exported below the, the uh, mix layer um, in the form of DOC, 33% uh, of that DOC exported out of these, uh, out of these uh, macroalgal reefs 
makes its way um, into the deep water and is and is exported below the mixed layer or below yeah below the mixed layer. And then uh, with three exclamation points. And then if we go a little bit further and look at the data and compare the total sequestered carbon compared to the that attributed to DOC, they're claiming that 68% of the total carbon sequestered from macroalgal ex product, export production is from DOC. And so that's, it's interesting, but it's it's a quite a large, quite a large number. And now it really uh, takes a little further study to kind of resolve and constrain the reality of that number. And so that takes some some experimental work and field work. And one of the one of the goals of this project is to understand production, uh, fate, and export of, of dissolved organic matter. So if we just look at some preliminary experiments that we did a long time ago, these were kind of we call them sledgehammer experiments, where we we try to produce a a, a result, um, an accrued experimental design to see if one, if we can see a signal, and then two, figure out how we can refine that experimental design to make it more realistic. So we refer to this early experiment as a blade in a bucket experiment, where we just took a, a blade, chopped it off, put it in a, a, a 20 liter uh, a container and, and, and measured the change in DOC over time and looked at the chemical characterization of that in the form of neutral sugars. And the main point here is that over the course of about five to six hours, we see big change in, in kelp derived DOC relative to the, the, to the um, just this traditional sterile water column or the water column water. And then we also noticed that the characterization of that in the form of neutral sugars was very different from that of the background seawater. So the main point here is that when we take a, a, a kelp blade and we chop it up and let it ooze into a, uh, into a, a container, it's going to release a lot of DOC. So that's consistent with the idea that there's a lot of DOM being produced, but it's not a very it's not a very realistic experimental design. So subsequent work led by um, Ellie Halewood, Clint, Clint Shannon, and later by Chance and Anna uh, went out and um, tried to try to measure the the uh, release of DOC or DOC productivity um, in situ using these sleeve experiments. They would take a, these polyethylene bags, they would sleeve the, a, a blade, incubate for several hours, and then take the bag, uh, remove the bag and the kelp, um, and, um, and then measure the um, amount of DOM that was produced over that period of time. The main findings from that, from that work published in Reed et al. 2015 showed that about two, two to three times more DOC um, was produced in the blades compared to the stipes and that the stipes and blades both produce 30 uh, and 80% more DOC respectively during the day versus, versus night. And the basic take home is that um, at best, we're seeing about 14% of NPP being released as, as, uh, as DOC from this kelp reef. So that's, that's a little bit different from, from, the, uh, from, the, from, the, from the nature paper. Okay. But what we don't really know much about is the fate of that material. And so these are um, some real simplistic bioavailability studies. Effectively, what we do is we take the DOM that were produced in these uh, blade in the bucket experiments, and we um, inoculate that material with uh, uh, naturally occurring microbial assemblages collected from around the near shore environment. And we let them incubate in the dark for periods of days to weeks and measure the change in DOC and the change in, in character of the organic matter. And what we see here is that microbial remineralization of the kelp DOC was very rapid over the first two weeks. We lost about 70% of the initial DOM that was produced during those um, production experiments. And, but it didn't bottom out. So we do see uh, a holding pattern where after about two weeks, um, the DOC concentrations did not decrease significantly um, over time. And so that is we we regard, regard that as persistent DOC. And big question there is is that is this the Krauss Jenkins Duarte sequestrable carbon? We don't know that answer. Um, these experiments are pretty um, informative, but but not very realistic. And so we need to kind of fine tune the design to make these experiments more realistic, with the questions that need to be addressed, including um, you know our is the, are the experiments where they incubated for a long enough period of time? Do we need to vary the microbial communities that are being inoculated into these experiments? And, um, and we, need to, we need to 
devise a technique that where we're capturing more re realistically de uh, kelp derived DOM, perhaps using the, the kelp uh, sleeve bag technique to, to capture um, instantaneously produced DOM from kelp rather than chopping a blade and putting it into a container. So just to, to uh, review, uh, basically from the, um, the, the questions that we want to address in theme 2B is, is, the, is, the, water, is the water column organic matter organ uh, being altered as it flows through the kelp forest? What is the bioavailability or remineralization rates and how they differ between in and out uh, of the kelp forest? And um, is there a distinct microbial signature, both in terms of phylogenetic structure, community structure, and microbial activity? associated with that passage of materials through the, through the kelp bed. And so this is, um, these are some of the questions that are, were, have been addressed um, in recent work, um, well, past work by, by, uh, by Chance and, and Anna, but also followed up from some experiments conducted just over the last several weeks um, by Chance, which he's going to, to highlight uh, now. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chance unless there's some questions I can address. Question, Craig. Sure. Um, the the apparently persistent DOM. The way you talked about it, it sounded like you were assuming that that was kelp material that simply um, hadn't been metabolized. What's the likelihood, though, that that actually is metabolized kelp DOM um, that that's actually now microbial product that's reprocessed as opposed to unprocessed original material. Uh, kind of going to the uh, microbial carbon pump where you're taking labile material and converting into a recalcitrant compound. Or not that's, even recalcitrant, but just stuff that's still cycling and recycling because it's, it's microbial and they produce stuff. They don't just catabolize, they also anabolize, so. Um, and, yeah, I mean, in soils, I we try to avoid the word recalcitrant in these days because nothing really is truly. Well, the given hypothesis is that um, as you take, according to the microbial carbon pump, is that mm -hmm. as labile available DOM is consumed, there's a, there's a right. recalcitrant persistent byproduct that's kicked off. We don't know. We can't differentiate that from okay. uh, that change. It's just stalled. And so you're right. Is this stalled yeah. because you're having some kind of equilibrium between production of compounds and consumption? Of course, this is done in the dark, so we have shut down at least photo auditor right. for processes. Yeah, there's no fresh input, so things are yeah. changing. So, so, so there should be a one. -way, there should be a one-way street in that perspective, but um, but you're right. We can't tell whether they're part of this accumulated persistent material is recently produced from the as a byproduct of recent heterotrophic activity. Right. What we that do know is that. We do, what we do know is it hasn't bottomed out. And so, and what we're saying here is that this is the material, the red is the seawater and the blue is the, is the kelp on top of what the seawater uh, that they were leaking into is. So that delta is the kelp derived DOM. And it, because right. it hasn't, simplistically, because it hasn't bottomed out there, that's how we interpret it as a persistent compound. Craig, I, I had one question. Um, there's been some papers that have that have showed that um, you know DOC can kind of precipitate and form these flocks and things like that. Is, yeah, is, mm -hmm. is that going on in these experiments at all? We don't. Um, I don't think we've. I don't think we have done a good enough job resolving if if it has. But basically, the idea is you can create conditions where you're producing a lot of TEP, and then over time the TEP aggregates and sinks out. So that could be part of this. We are only sampling from the water column part of the of the carboys that these are incubations are conducted in. So there could be flock on the bottom. We haven't we haven't been able to resolve. We don't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not um, those transparent polymers aren't aren't there. We don't know. Thanks. Chance, you want to hit it? Is everyone seeing it? The, yeah. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chance English. I'm a third year uh, in Craig's lab in the marine science program. Yeah. 
so just to reiterate, you know, kelp partitions is biomass and the particulate phases and the dissolved phase. A lot of the focus is looked at what happens to the particulate stuff that you can see, but we don't know a whole lot about what happens to the dissolved phase. You know, it has two main fates. You can think of it's it's used to fuel heterotrophic uh, bacterial production and respiration, uh, in which it goes back to CO2, or it persists and it can be exported out of the system and put uh, potentially to depth and act as a um, carbon sequestration uh, mechanism. So the two main questions then are, you know, is this DOC remineralized by bacteria or does it persist for long enough times to be exported? Um, so one of the ways that we can determine the fate of, of DOC is through remineralization experiments, which Craig um, laid out um, earlier. So the, the main thing in our, in our first look in, a, in our approach to DOC and how it's produced in the kelp forest and is potentially exported out is we wanted to look if and see if there was a difference in the DOC pool inside and outside of the canopy um, and see if there is a difference in the, in the amount of remineralization or the persistence of DOC that we collect both inside or outside. So the, the main idea behind these cultures is we uh, set them up by collecting a bacterial community as a 1.2 filtrate and we inoculate that into a media that's free of bacteria and other particles. So it's just the DOC substrate from that, from that site, uh, which is it's collected as a 0.2 micron filtrate. Uh, we incubate them in the dark to prevent any new production of organic matter. So the bacteria are forced to grow on, on the previously accumulated DOM pool. Um, and so the resulting dilution allows us to observe how much ambient DOC is available to bacteria over several weeks. So we did this uh, in the kelp forest uh, in March, 2018 at a inside inside the canopy and then and outside the canopy. And so we see that changes in the DOC between the inside and the outside are similar in magnitude over the entire three weeks. And, and even the initial concentrations of DOC were similar, um, suggesting there was potentially some equilibrium um, as water was flowing inside and outside of the canopy. Um, but what we do see is however that the inside community remineralizes that DOC almost three times as fast as the outside community. Right. And, and so what we wanted to know is that, is this difference in the metabolic rate, is this a function of the uh, DOC quality? So is, is the inside DOC just more labile, so it turns over much more rapidly? Or is this a function of the, the community that's inside? So is their metabolism just spun up um, so that they remineralize DOC faster, or are they just more capable of, of consuming labile organic matter faster? So one way we wanted to test this is, so we took that inside inoculum, that 1.2 micron filtrate, and we mixed it into the outside DOC substrate. And so basically we're forcing them to grow on DOC that was sourced from outside of the canopy. And we see that when we, and so the idea here is if, if the drawdown rate of DOC is similar to the outside rate, then we, then we can say, well, it was the DOC that was inside the canopy was really labile and that's why we saw that enhanced rate. But if we see a drawdown rate that's more similar to the inside community's rate, then we can say that it's actually the community that has a really enhanced metabolism and, and that's what's resulting in this really rapid remineralization of DOC inside the canopy. And so when we do this mix, um, we basically find that the inside community maintained a really high respiration rate uh, despite being grown on substrate from outside. And so this is just sort of our first look at, at trying to see if we can see differences in DOC availability inside versus outside of the reef. And so basically what we first found from this is that the bacterial community inside the kelp forest rapidly consumes DOC, both inside and outside of the kelp forest, and about six micromole of carbon is available to the bacteria on time scales of a week. Uh, and a, but a similar magnitude of DOC is available to communities outside, but on time scales of about three weeks. So next, what we wanted to do is, um, so these bottle incubations are really useful and they tell us a lot about you know, how much DOC uh, is available and how, how rapidly it turns over on time scales of days to, to weeks or months, but it's, it's really artificial. You know, we're taking this bacterial community and we're confining it for, for weeks to months at a time. Um, and so what we wanted to see is, is, are we able to resolve differences in the bacterial community's um, activity? So the metabolism on time scales more relevant to water flowing through the canopy. So, um, and additionally, do we see differences in the DOC quantity and quality as you move from outside of the canopy to inside of the, um, through the canopy and then back outside. So, so we decided to do this um, before COVID, we had planned to do this, but um, obviously things got shut down. And so we were able to do our first iteration of this last month. Um, and so the approach is basically we 
sample a transect across the canopy and sample for DOC uh, nutrient spectral abundance composition, uh, as well as the uh, respiration rates of both the microbial community and, and the bacterial fractions. And additionally, we conducted another inside outside remineralization experiment to look and see if we, we see those, so that same trend of, of enhanced remineralization for bacteria that are inside the canopy. Um, so highlighted in bold are the samples that we have analyzed and, and will be shown today. Um, just to note, respiration, we measured using an INT reduction method. So it measures the formation of a formazin salt by incubating samples with a tetrazoleum salt um, that's reduced by the electron transport system. Um, I can walk through that method uh, for anyone after if, if you're interested. But. So sampling occurred last month at Arroyo Camado. And so on the left side is a Landsat image, false colored to show the canopy in green. Uh, the image was then used to estimate canopy biomass shown on the plot on the right. And sampling was done at the five stations shown across the canopy, um, moving from outside through the, through the edges and inside the canopy and then back, back out um, outside of the canopy. And thanks to Tom Bell for the, for the images. So across the transect, we observed measurable differences in bacterial abundance, dissolved organic carbon, total organic carbon. Uh, TOC is, is a measure of DOC plus the carbon from cells and, and, and ammonium. So DOC, and T, DOC, TOC, and bacterial abundance showed a similar pattern increasing from stations five to one, and ammonium showed the opposite trend. So we think what we're seeing is that there's an increase. Uh, we think the increase in bacterial abundance and total organic carbon is telling us that bacteria are consuming organic matter and using it to build biomass. So the, the observed uh, surface current during sampling was variable. However, there was a slight increase in temperature from stations five to one, which makes us think we're seeing that potentially uh, DOC and bacteria are accumulating as water is flowing across the canopy. But um, we want to confirm this with data from the ADCP, uh, which was located at station three. So for respiration rates, we obtained samples for microbial uh, community respiration, so the entire microbial community, the non-bacterial fractions, which include things like grazers and, and phytoplankton, uh, and the bacterial uh, respiration. Um, so the main findings are basically that uh, the metabolisms of the microbial community are, across the canopy are, and, as, and the non-bacterial fractions are significantly higher inside of the canopy than at the edges or outside, and the bacterial respiration rate uh, is significantly higher inside the canopy except for station one, just barely. And so, basically, um, yeah. so we're seeing an enhanced, uh, basically, metabolic activity going on inside of the canopy versus outside, and and that's coupled to what we're seeing as a as a potentially an accumulation of dissolved organic carbon, which can fuel uh, heterotrophic bacterial production inside the canopy. So next we wanted to, we performed another remineralization experiment uh, inside and outside of the canopy to see if these, these differences in the DOC um, resulted in differences in, in how much was available for bacteria and how much persisted. So the initial conditions for the, the inside and outside, so station three being the inside station, station five being the outside station, the initial conditions were markedly different with regards to the initial DOC concentration the uh, bacterial abundance and the bacterial respiration. Okay. And so as before, we set up the experiments by inoculating the resident bacterial community into their 0.2 micron source water. Um, however, in addition to just the DOC, we took measurements for uh, bacterial abundance to measure bacterial growth over time, as well as DNA to look at what taxa might be responsible for the turnover of the DOC we see. Um, and additionally, we, we monitored the incubations using a, a biological oxygen demand system, which provides measurements for oxygen using an optical optode, um, which we use to, to estimate respiration in the incubations. So we're still running all the DOC um, samples from, from, these, from this experiment. And so I'll be presenting the oxygen uh, consumption from this, from this autobod um, as a proxy for DOC remineralization. And with the assumption that the ratio of oxygen consumption to, D to DOC removal is about one to one. Okay, so the figures shown here. Um, so the top plot is showing the change in oxygen. So this is showing the change in oxygen over the first seven days of the experiment. 
The bottom plot is showing the change in cell abundance for the first seven days. And the colors represent uh, their location. So blue line being inside at station three and the red line being outside at station five. And so as in the previous remand experiment we did, we see enhanced respiration occurring inside the canopy. Uh, and in addition, uh, this time bacteria grow to a much higher density before entering death phase. Um, and again, we, when we feed the inside community DOC from the outside, we see it maintain its high respiration rate, although changes in cell abundance over time is lower, suggesting a diminished efficiency when fed on DOC from the outside. So just some summary, summary characteristics of these incubations shown in this table. So we have growth rate in the first column and the, magnet, the total magnitude of oxygen removal over the first day, the first two days, and between days two and seven. So the main differences we see are bacterial growth rates uh, are highest for the inside incubation, followed by the mixed and then the lowest rates being out for the outside community. And differences in the change of oxygen were most pronounced within the first day of the incubation where the inside community fed on either DOC sourced from inside or outside the canopy, respired at a rate four to five times faster than the, than the outside community. We see within two days of the incubation, we still see uh, that enhanced respiration occurring by the inside community, whether it's fed on DOC from outside or inside. But we do see that between days two and seven, the total respiration of oxygen was similar between all the incubations. So what we think, again, what we're seeing here is that the bacterial community inside the canopy grow at much higher rates uh, than, than the outside community. And, and the largest difference uh, in the respiration rate occurring over the first two days suggests that this difference in activity is, is maybe due to, to the consumption of more labile organic matter that's being um, consumed really rapidly. Uh, additionally, if we look at the total removal of oxygen uh, between the inside and outside over the first two days, the difference between that magnitude is, is similar to the difference in magnitude of the initial DOC concentrations. So I think this is basically what this is telling us is that the, the additional DOC that's accumulated inside the canopy is, is really rapidly turned over uh, within, a mat, within a number of days, suggesting that, that that DOC in the kelp canopy is, is really labile and turns over really rapidly, which would, would go against that, you know, that kelp DOC is, is more recalcitrant and persists long enough to be exported out of, out of the system. So from this, these just first uh, looks at uh, through these experiments, basically we're seeing that stocks of DOC and bacteria are variable across the canopy and as well are the rates of community respiration and uh, which are typically, which are significantly higher inside the canopy. And the bacterial community respiration is, is typically higher, although um, it was similar to one of the outside stations. Um, and, and the inside community, inside, uh, inside the canopy appears to be primed to rapidly consume labile organic matter, whether it's from inside or outside the canopy. So next, what we want to do to follow up on this is repeat this transect regularly and, ex and expand it to Mohawk Reef so we can get an idea for how does the canopy size and the, the density of the kelp uh, as well and the current velocities influence the observed gradients that we've, that we've seen here. Uh, and additionally, we want to include measurements for bacterial production. Um, bacterial production measurements, along with bacterial respiration measurements, will give us an idea of the growth yield for bacteria, so we can estimate how much of the DOC they're, they're remineralizing is accumulating as biomass, which can be shuttled up to higher trophic levels, or is most, or if it's a low growth efficiency, it can most of it's just being respired back to CO2. Okay. So um, that's it for the the um, experiments and the sampling we've done so far. And so next step is just sort of some musing about where we hope to take some of, um, take these types of experiments in the future and um, to answer some questions about kelp related DOC. So the first is, um, is the variability that we've seen so far in the bacterial metabolism inside and outside the community, inside and outside the kelp, is this a, a effect of direct or is this a direct or indirect effect of the kelp? So, for, uh, for example, is is kelp is the bacterial metabolism being directly stimulated by DOC released by the kelp, or is it that the kelp fosters a, a really uh, dense community of invertebrates and fish, which may be directly releasing labile organic matter inside of the inside of the canopy? So it's 
it's in, you know, the kelp is indirectly feeling DOC that's available for, for the bacteria. Um, second, so most of the work we've done so far is focused on the free living community, but we want to know um, how the we want to know how the attached community may influence the cycling of DOC in the canopy. So we want to try and get estimates of, of its activity and its respiration rates. And three, we want to get a handle on what is the long-term fate of kelp derived DOC, i.e. Its, its export potential. Um, so for the first question, um, you know, is, is the bacteria, is the variability in the metabolism of bacteria a direct or indirect effect of the kelp? There's kind of two ways we can go about this. You know, one, we can look for enzymatic activity associated with specific kelp compounds. So something like alginate. So alginate lysase, uh, this, this enzyme, when it basically when bacteria produce it to degrade alginate, the products of that enzymatic cleavage uh, absorb in the UV region. And so we can tie in directly estimates of bacterial respiration to potentially a uh, proxy for um, remineralization of a, of a compound we know is a significant part of, of kelp biomass. Uh, the other thing we can do is look for specific compounds like something like taurine, which is a common product of animal excretia. So we can see how much is, you know, animal uh, release inside of the kelp forest of uh, influencing uh, bacterial metabolism. And, and these can be easily folded into the, the monthly surveys of Kmato and Mohawk that we're looking to do. So the second approach uh, thing we want to look at is, is investigating the activity of bacteria living on the kelp blades. Um, so as, as Craig showed uh, earlier, these, these attached communities are really diverse and they're distinct from the surrounding seawater. Uh, and they've been shown to shift both in, in response to time and also potential stressors such as bryozoan and crustacean or uh, temperature. And so we want to get an idea of, of how does this variability potentially impact cycling of, of dissolved organic carbon and also, uh, these communities are likely the first sort of contact for the DOC released by kelp. And so if, there, if there's significant variability in the metabolism, it might be affecting what's actually happening to the DOC by the time it, it reaches the free living community um, and, and could potentially maybe change uh, its availability to those bacteria. So the approach we're, we're working on um, to, to actually measure the rate of the attached community is, is using an INT reduction method. So basically we incubate the bacteria with a tetrazoleum salt. INT is reduced by the electron transport system and produces a formazin crystal inside the cell. We can extract that formazin and, and quantify it using a spec. And, and the rate of that formazin products uh, formation is a proxy for respiration. And so this is sort of a breakdown of, of how we've gone about this so far. So we take a kelp blade, we cut it into five individual pieces. We kill two, uh, and we, we suspend it into a, a 0.2 filtered water. So water that's been uh, cleared of any other bacteria or any other uh, essentially thing that might be respiring. So once we've done that, we uh, kill two as a control and incubate and inoculate them all with this INT salt and incubate them for two hours. After the incubation time, we terminate the, uh, the rest of the living treatments. And once, we once we've done that, we can take the strips of kelp and use something like the super sucker, which was shown before to extract cells for DNA extraction. So essentially we take the super sucker. Right. So we take the super sucker. Sorry, I just got some from the chat. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, so we take the super sucker uh, and basically what it does is it forces water onto the surface of the kelp and, and basically collects the, the microbes living on it and collect, recollects it back into the, into the syringe. So once we've, we do that a couple of times on the same spot, we can potentially say we've, you know, we've collected uh, much of the, of the community living on the blade. And so once we've done that, we can concentrate those cells and extract the formazin uh, that they formed something like this. And so we can then take those, that, that formism we've extracted and measure it on a spec and get an idea of what the concentration is. Uh, and, and we can use this as a direct proxy or an estimate for, for respiration rates. So the one time we've done this, we managed to get a resolvable rate of about five milligrams of carbon per meter square per day. Um, it's, it's pretty small compared to say the net primary production of kelp. Um, but it, it could be a much more significant removal process for the DOC that's being released by the blades. 
Um, so this is a, you know, we're still workshopping this method. It's, it's pretty new, but we think it could potentially be useful for, for measuring activity of the attached community without, well, without having to disrupt them uh, too much. And the, and the short incubation time of, of two hours prevents any, any real crazy level of, of oozing or anything like that. Yeah. And so the last thing we want to target is, is uh, what's the potential for kelp derived DOC for export? So Craig showed this image earlier, uh, which shows the, con the estimated contributions uh, for macroalgal organic matter to contribute to long-term carbon storage. So they estimate that you know about 30% of, of macroalgal in that primary production leaves the forest as DOC. And then they estimate about a third of that is exported from the algal bed uh, below the mixed layer. So some caveats to these estimates is that they are, the ratio of their uh, how they estimate how much DOC is available for export based on how much was produced is, is based off of estimates of DOC production and exports from open ocean uh, phytoplankton derived DOC. And we know that macroalgal DOC is rich in, in, really in a lot of complex carbohydrates and neutral sugars, which are distinct from the surrounding seawater. Um, so they may have removal patterns which are different from phytoplankton derived DOC. So one of the ways we can try and uh, get a better handle on, on what's the fate of this DOC is to return to these blade in a bag sleeved incubations. So, but rather than just measuring how much DOC is released, we take that DOC and we inoc and basically we inoculate it with the, with the ambient community and observe how much of it remains after periods of uh, not just weeks, but, but several months. And so it's persistence over those several months will tell us you know, how, uh, what its potential is for, for long-term export and carbon storage. So we can compare it to a control, which is basically just the ambient seawater that we would have we would have incubated the blade in. And so here I'll just show a conceptual diagram of, of how the decay of DOC might look if the, if the DOC from the kelp is either labile, semi-labile, or more recalcitrant. So if it's really labile, we would expect uh, the DOC to be rapidly attenuated within the first couple of days with, with none available for export over the long uh, you know, three month period. If it's more semi labile we'd expect some of it to turn over within a couple of months, but a substantial fraction would resist degradation and, and is thus available for export. Uh, but if it's more recalcitrant, then we would expect, you know, the, maybe the initial background DOC to be removed, but the vast majority of it to remain within uh, for the, for the, nine month or the three month incubation. And so this is just a conceptual diagram of, of where we want to go and what we might expect um, if, um, yeah, for varying degrees of lability of kelp DOC. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all I have today. Um, so thank you uh, to all of the analysts and, and people who helped collect samples for me and all that. And uh, yeah, uh, Craig will answer any questions. <laughs> Um, Allison has a question. Yeah. That was a nice talk, Chance. Um, it seems like to actually compare what you're calling metabolism inside and outside, you would have to normalize everything to the cell abundance first. Have you tried doing that? Um, no, but the, like, uh, for these, this last treatment we did, because we're diluting all of the samples, the initial concentration, where is it? The initial concentrations of all of the cells were, were relatively the same. Is that like, is that what you're talking about? Kind of, but, but, but then like by the second day, you have a lot more cells. And so the fact that you have a really rapid oxygen drawdown between days one and two, what you're interpreting as those cells being like, especially awesome respirers could just be that there's more cells. So the, the, what you're saying is the cell specific respiration. Between. Yeah, exactly. I think that that would be, I think it's interesting to look at it this way, but I think it would also be good to look at it the other way too. Okay. Thanks. Is, oh, I have a second question that I will just yeah. answer myself. Is that ETS method like the same, is that the Packard method from like? Uh, it's a, the, the, the Packard, they, they, they're not a huge fan of it. It's a variation on, on their method. Um, because theirs isn't theirs isn't in vitro, so they actually 
kill all the cells and just measure potential respiration. So they extract the dehydrogenase enzymes and measure and then flood it with reducing equivalents and, and measure the potential respiration based on a assumed map, basically a calculated mass of, of how much dehydrogenase there is. This is in vivo, so you don't, you're not actually killing it. So it's, the caveat is it's less specific basically to the amount this one. Cool, thanks. Um, I had a quick question about the method too, and this is, uh, probably something I missed or ignorance, but is it, I guess it's expected that the kelp itself doesn't take up the um, formazan or whatever it's called? Yeah, so, I mean, this, it can, so it's, it's sensitive to photoautotrophs, but because we're basically collecting the cells by blasting them off with the super sucker, the idea is we're not, we're, you know, hopefully not collecting the kelp tissue cells in that, in that resuspension. I see. <clears throat> um, another question I had, I guess, uh, looking at your map, um, it seems like it seems a little surprised. The transect uh, isn't like it's not super obvious, like what you might have chosen based on the kelp. Is there a mismatch there between the picture of the kelp and the and how it was when you went out there? Or I was just curious about why you chose those spots. I guess. Yeah, um, we, we'd hope to just get a clean transect through, you know, but it was pretty patchy that day um, from what we had expected rather than it just being like a complete canopy. Yeah, um, I know how that is, right. Yeah, and, and we've had, we've been trying for a while to, to get like a clean transect through, but it just keeps kind of happening that, that this is what we get. So the, the right. hope was that we at least just get a good coverage across the canopy. Right. Yeah, it might be good to, inst I mean, it's it sounds like then that this map of the kelp may be misrepresenting like what the conditions were when you went went out there. Um, oh, this is, um, so this, uh, the satellite imagery was actually the same hour that Clint collected the water for us, so. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, we had a pretty fortunate, um, hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Does anybody have a, have a question? Otherwise I'll just keep asking questions. We don't want that. <laughs> I, I, I got a question regarding the, the transect. Um, yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to recall Ellie's paper, you know, she showed, I, I believe, you know, a gradient in DOC from the kelp bed offshore to four kilometers or so. And I guess that, that gradient varied depending on the time of year. And it was interesting that that you saw in one case, I think it was 2018, where there was no difference in DOC inside versus out. And then the other sample period there was. And I'm wondering, um, is there any value in extending your transect to a station that's much farther offshore where you know maybe that there's not a signal? I'm, I'm just wondering how Ellie's paper might fit into your design here is all. Yeah, I, I think there, there would be uh, added value in, in having a, like a true kind of outside station. Um, this was, uh, we, like, like, like you'd mentioned, we, we hadn't been seeing any real resolvable difference inside or outside of the DOC concentrations for when we were doing it at Mohawk. That year was, the, the kelp canopy was pretty sparse pretty much every time we went out to, to sample through it. So it may have been, we just weren't seeing it because it wasn't very dense and the water was just ripping through it really quickly. Um, but yeah, and I think having an, having added stations that are more offshore would, would tie in, I think, really nicely to the physical measurements going on with the LTR and, and might potentially allow us to sort of see instances in which there's these pulses of, of, of DOC that are being exported offshore, um, things like that. So it's, it's you know, it's, but it's just every, Every station we add is a is a is a lot of extra work that that goes into doing all this. But yeah, Dave, see your hand. Yeah, I just have a quick question about sort of long time the long time sequestration. You know, from a from a carbon dioxide removal strategy 
point of view. We want something that's decades, which is beyond the point the, your 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 lifespan as a graduate student. So, is there a way that we can characterize the composition, or are there other tricks to play to say how much of it is semi how much of it is recalcitrant and Anyways, I'm just trying to figure out how how we can do that so we can come up with estimates of its decomposition that are kind of relevant for that policy discussion. So you're thinking, and so our way of estimating how much is long-term recalcitrant is, is through these incubations. And you're saying, is there a way to just get like an instantaneous characterization of the DOC that, that can tell us how much of it is well, recalcitrant? Or well, we need to know what its state, what its fate is over much longer time scales than you can do it experimentally. So I'm just, you know, are there ways to 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 think about how we did that? I know stuff that Craig and Dennis and Dennis Hansel and I did did years ago, where, where we used age tracers in the North Atlantic to to make some statements about that. But I'm just I'm just kind of curious what if, if there's other ways to think about that. You need some tracer. That would identify that be characterizing and you know looking at the bulk pool is is difficult to tease out who's who's the producer was right so mm -hmm. that's a challenge <clears throat> yeah thanks yeah jenny yeah that these were great talks thanks i really appreciate it i always learn so much when i listen to you guys it's fantastic um I was just, you know, I do a lot with sort of drift kelp and I was just thinking, I'm wondering if, you know, we might expect a similar uh, bacterial response to drift kelp, which would be, you know, potentially contacting other bacterial communities. You know, I'm talking about a large mat of drift kelp, not just a single blade or a single plant, but as it sort of floated through the ocean, you know, would it be sort of stimulating microbial production of different communities, you know, as it went offshore or further inshore and, you know, just more just your thoughts on, on this. I, I think it's, you know, really interesting how much response you saw to the, to the kelp, but it must be producing DOC once it's no longer attached to the bottom as well. Yeah, I'd imagine that, you know, it'd be really difficult, I think, to, to, find like a trace that's that's sort of being left behind as these kelp patties are floating around um but but yeah i don't I'd imagine if as long you know if you could estimate how much doc that's releasing that it, it could be available to simulate bacteria you know even even after it's no longer attached to the reef so okay thanks yeah um yeah, I'd be sort of, I'm sort of picturing these rafts as kind of having a plume of DOC sort of, you know, some sort of track that they would be producing as they, as they floated around. So that, that's great. Thanks. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, we're pretty much out of time. Um, one more quick question. Sorry, uh, if, and if you need to leave, um, first of all, thanks, Craig and Chance. This is great. Um, I was curious, I know, you know, one of the problems we always have with these inside outside kind of comparisons is that the water flow is not always moving. Uh, you know, it kind of has to be calibrated against the water flow, um, as I think Dan was getting at. And uh, I was wondering if there's some kind of, if if you guys have thought of doing some kind of like for example, a dye experiment or something like that to track a parcel of water as it moves out of the forest and how, and how the DOC concentration might change over time. Yeah, I think we, we first wanted to try doing that. I think there's, like, there's that red dye um, somebody used, but we, we, I think we're told no. Um, but I can't remember. It was a couple of years ago that we first thought about doing that. I think some of the, the experimental design would be better informed with tight coupling be, with, uh, with Nick's physical group. So, so if you had a better understanding of the, 
of the physics at the sampling time that may help make this, but these are challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're hoping that to get something out of the ADCP that's that's out there um, at station that's at the station three that was shown. Um, but right now, it's sort of when they go out, it's you know, what's the surface current doing, and you know, hope that it's maintained over the sampling period. But I mean, it can be variable over even a day, so it's hard to it's hard to achieve. Yeah. Guys, can you hear me? It's Sally. I, I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. You know, we, we looked into using rhodamine. That's the red dye chase a number of years ago. And even a permit wasn't required. And the only thing is, it's a pretty comprehensive experiment. You put the tracer down and then you've got to have like kayaks with thermometers on a grid. Um, but it is a doable experiment. I've always thought it'd be really interesting to do. Um, but, and you would probably have to have several realizations just given, you know, the variability in the background currents. Yeah, that would, I mean, that would be really, really cool. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to do something like these transects, but, you know, have it on a dial period. So, you know, within a couple of hours, you know, the tide can, can swing the current in any direction. And so it'd be, it'd be useful to have it over a period of a day to really tease out where that water is moving through and everything. So that would, that would be cool. Yeah. Well, the other thing you could do is, um, since you can see it, you could put drones out and look down and then you would get a handle on what that flow path was like. Um, that when we were first conceiving this, we didn't have the drones. It's Tom here. Right, yeah, um, and actually, Lee and Ellen um, Carter have done quite a few dye experiments and have the fluorometry equipment, I think, to track track those plumes and stuff. But um, the work with Nick might also uh, help with that, at least. Concern with the dye is the potential contaminant to the organic. That would oh. be a thing that we need to figure out. But yeah it's a, if it you know i don't know right it does fluoresce too so all right well thanks everyone um you're welcome to stay if you want to further discuss but uh i want to be respectful of everybody's time great thanks everyone thanks great. bob thanks chance yeah. great job wonderful, chance wonderful techniques guys Really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.